and welcome everybody to another edition of Historical Geocaching on the Road with the Geocacher Tim Photobug from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Today is really, really exciting. This is the start of my fall break and I am embarking with a bunch of my classmates on a really cool trip up to New England to visit all sorts of cool, awesome Adventist historical locations. I, I'm really, really excited about that. Um, never been to New England, so I get to visit a new place and get to film as well. Because I was going to say, I'm not only excited that I get to go there myself, but also that I get to take you guys along with this video camera. So lots of fun times ahead. Come along with me as I travel to New England having a blast with the past. Geocacher TN Photobug greetings from Fairhaven, Massachusetts. Yes, that's right, folks. Many miles and hours later since I shot that little bit of video at a Tennessee rest area yesterday, we are now in Fairhaven, Massachusetts in beautiful fall color laden New England. Just gorgeous, gorgeous, awesome scenery. I've really been enjoying all the beauty out the window. And um, right now, my classmates are getting some breakfast. I've already eaten, but um, next first stop of the day here in Fairhaven, actually, we're going to be visiting some sites important to the, to the life of Joseph Bates. Joseph Bates was one of the key Seventh-day Adventist pioneers. He was a sea captain, um, headquartered here in Fairhaven. He went to um, he went to sea at an early age and retired in his 30s and just had so many incredible experiences at sea. Just that right there could fill volumes. But then he became a Christian and became involved in the temperance movement. And once God convicted him of the Seventh Day Sabbath truth, he was just unstoppable. His enthusiasm and zeal and dedication. And excitement and just passion for teaching people how Saturday is the true Seventh Day Sabbath is just a real inspiration to me. I feel like if I had to compare him to somebody, it would probably be the Apostle Paul. Just their excitement and enthusiasm and zeal is just awesome, inspiring. And so I'm really excited that I got to actually visit some of the sites today of where these stories that took place. And yeah, come along with me as I follow in the footsteps of Joseph Bates here in Fairhaven, Massachusetts. Over here, this is Fairhaven. Here, some of the places you'll see are back over this way the Bates home and several of his houses we live and the church where he built and so forth. But that's the bridge right there. And I'm going to give you the background and then tell you the story that took place in the bridge if you haven't heard it already. It's all in your, your book by Bert, but I'll, I'll take a slightly different perspective on this thing. I'm not putting it all together. Delicate. It's all privately owned. You see there's a gate there, so you can only go so far. One time I snuck back there with somebody and they were able to go over there again. And then, uh, the bridge lasted till about the 1960s. And then it was torn down and this is what's left of it now. So this is a good beginning point for our Adventist Heritage Tours. It's appropriate because you could consider Fairhaven as the theological birthplace of Seventh-day Adventism. Usually we consider the Millerite farmer and say that the Millerite farm is the theological birthplace of Adventism, 
That's where, of course, William Miller taught the second coming and they understood what really was happening in the sanctuary and in a sense it is, has great theological significance. And then some have said that Hiram Edson's home in western New York is also the theological birthplace of Adventism because that's where Edson had that new insight on the sanctuary the day after the disappointment. But in reality, this place, this city, namely the bunker home that we're going to see as we leave today, uh, leave Fairhaven today, that's the theological birthplace, birthplace of Adventism. Because that's where Joseph Bates hammered out the theology of the Sabbath, the end time events, and the great controversy is in the bunker home from the years 1845 to 1847. I'll come to that in a moment. Let me start with, how did Bates get the Sabbath? And I'm, this is going to lead me to the story that took place on the, the bridge. Well, first we start with a Millerite leader by the name of Thomas M. Preble. D. M. Preble. D. M. Preble was a Millerite leader, preacher. But Preble had been studying the scriptures and he had been influenced by Seventh-day Baptists. He had been reading some of their literature. And he was convicted that Christians should keep the Sabbath. And so in February of 1845, this is after the disappointment, okay? So you know the disappointment was in October of 1844. February of 1845, he published in a, a magazine, Hope of Israel, an article on the Sabbath, advocating Sabbath keeping. In February, Joseph Bates, who was an avid reader, let me back up and just tell you again, Bates, that's a sea captain, he had a bright mind. The guy was into all kinds of uh, temperance movements and anything related to spiritual matter matters. That captured Bates' attention, especially by the time he had embraced William Miller's teaching. He became one of the Millerite leaders. He experienced the disappointment. He was searching after the disappointment, like many other Millerites were, and that's when he encountered Preble's tract on the Sabbath in February. And Bates was convicted by it and really considered keeping the Sabbath. Then in March of 1845, Preble came out with his tract, a little booklet on the Sabbath. He had a very creative title for it. Let me read you the full title. Tract showing that the seventh day should be observed as the Sabbath instead of the first day, according to the commandment. And that was his real creative title for his track. As I will show you, Joseph Bates was much, he, he was, he had captured more of the modern impulse of, of catchy titles. His book on the Sabbath had a much better catchy title than Preble's did. But nevertheless, that track reinforced what Preble had said in the smaller article. Bates read that, and at that point, he became convicted on the Sabbath. And started to keep the Sabbath. But then there was a problem. Because later in the spring of 45, <clears throat> Bates encountered the, the spiritualizers. Now, what were the spiritualizers? Let me back up and go back to the Millerite movement and the Great Disappointment. After the Great Disappointment, and this is something I covered in your outline, that outline page I went over last night. I skipped over this part because I wanted to save it for now. On that outline, I mentioned October 22, 1844, and then the fallout afterward. In the months following the disappointment, you had several groups emerge. The first group were what I call projectionists. That was led by Joshua V. Himes, who was the main leader in the Millerite movement. Remember I said last night he put William Miller on the map, so to speak, and got him in the big cities and became Miller's real great helper and the leader of the entire Millerite cause. Himes felt that after the disappointment, the whole thing was a mistake. Miller's calculations of October 22, 1844, year-day principle, all of that, it was a big mistake. And so he rejected everything, and the majority of the Millerites who kept their faith in the Second Coming followed Himes, including William Miller himself. We'll learn more about that story in William Miller's latter years of his life after the disappointment when we get to the Miller farm. And it sounds bad that he rejected it, but Ellen White makes the most interesting statement about William Miller's spiritual destiny. We'll talk about that on Sunday. So, you 
have the rejectionist. They threw out everything. And by the way, Ellen White became a rejectionist for a period of time before she had her initial vision. More on that when we get to Portland. Then you had another group emerge. These were the spiritualizers. These were within several months after the disappointment as well. Now I'll come back to them. Let me just jump to the third group. These are the ones that came together on a new understanding of the sanctuary, would eventually accept the Sabbath and become Seventh-day Adventist. That's the group that Bates, of course, would, would help found. But now back to the spiritualizers. These were the fanatics. Pardon me? What would, what would you call Bates' group? Some of the Sabbatarians. These were the Sabbatarians. They weren't Sabbatarians initially, but when you look back on it, they were the ones who had become Sabbatarians. And I'm going to tell you how they became Sabbatarians here in a few minutes with Bates. Um, the spiritualizers, these guys were the fanatics. They went crazy. They, what they all tried to do is to make sense of the disappointment. What happened? It was so disappointing. It's what we call the great disappointment. And they concluded that Jesus did come on October 22, 1844. But he came in a spiritual way. And he established the spiritual millennium. So now the world is in a spiritual rest and Christians should be in spiritual rest. So a number of these people quit their jobs and they rested. All kinds of fanatical ideas emerged from this group. They felt since everything is spiritual, then the men could have more than one wife. This is not the same thing as the Mormons now, polygamy. But they called it spiritual wyvern. And so the men connected themselves with more than one wife in a spiritual connection. Although it was actually more than just spiritual connection. But what was worst, they took Jesus. See, they were spiritualists and took everything symbolic. But then when it came to Jesus' words, except you become as a little child, you cannot be born again, come into the kingdom of heaven. They took that literally and they shaved their heads and they began to act like little children. So much so that they would crawl into the churches and goo goo and gaga act like little babies because they were showing that they were children. They were spiritually ready for the kingdom of heaven. They were entering into the spiritual rest and so they acted like little children and, and it just went from bad to worse. In fact, Portland was a concentration of these spiritualizers and Joshua Himes who the dignified leader of the movement, Himes kept the entire Millerite movement free of fanaticism. And then after the disappointment and the rejection, he distanced his group from all the fanatics. And he wrote a letter to Miller one time and he said, fanaticism is a foot deep in Portland. So it was that bad. It's like going through foot deep mud. Uh, the fanaticism was so bad. Now what's interesting when you look at these spiritualizers, and some of the critics today try to attach Ellen White to these spiritualizers and James White and they Ellen White ran into these guys several times and each time she detached herself from them she had nothing to do with them except one interesting encounter but her visions went an opposite direction from what the spiritualizers did in fact some of the spiritualizers claim to have visions as well so Ellen White often gets associated with them when in reality she categorically rejected the spiritualizers teachings we have a number of testimonies of people who, who were there and acknowledged that Ellen and James White never became a part of the terrible fanaticism after the disappointment this is also connected with the, a uh, theory and our teaching of the post-disappointment Millerites called the shut door. And I'll talk about the shut door at another time, probably when we're going to pour. But anyway, all of that is a background now to Joseph Bates. We come back to Bates, and these spiritualizers were in this area as well. And they were, talk they were talking about the spiritual Sabbath. And Bates had listened to them. And he had learned about the Sabbath from Preble's very carefully worded theological tract. And by the way, Preble only kept the Sabbath three years and then rejected it. He never kept it again. He never became a leader in the Sabbath movement. It was Joseph Bates who would pick up the mantle. But he had some struggles at first. And it was because of these spiritualizers. So by the time we get to the summer of 1845, Bates is wavering on his conviction regarding the Sabbath. And he basically backs off from the Sabbath for about an entire year because he was confused by these spiritualizers. 
So we come to the spring, maybe late winter, early spring of 1846. Bates begins to restudy the Sabbath in the Bible. And his convictions grow on it again. And then he's convicted he should keep the Sabbath. He learns about a Sabbath keeping group north of here around Washington, New Hampshire. And that story you will learn more about tomorrow when we go to the Washington, New Hampshire church. But he learned about the preacher who lived in Hillsboro who was keeping the Sabbath. And Bates went to visit with him. It was his spiritual pilgrimage. This is, we don't know exactly when this happened. It's sometime in the, the spring of 1846. He traveled to New Hampshire. He went to visit with Frederick Wheeler, who was the pastor of the Washington, New Hampshire church, but Wheeler was living in Hillsboro, New Hampshire. And he arrived late one evening, knocked on the door, introduced himself, told Wheeler what he was all about. He was on the spiritual pilgrimage. They went in the living room and sat down and excitedly talked about the Sabbath to the wee hours of the night and then began to study their Bible. And they were so excited about the Sabbath, they studied it all night long. The next morning, Bates and Wheeler travel closer to the Washington church and to Millen Pond in that immediate area. We'll go to this spot, to the Sowerth Farnsworth home. And I will show you, actually, with Jim Nix's tour, we'll unite with his tour and he will take us by that spot. And I don't know if he'll get out and talk. If he does it, I will talk to you on the bus and tell you the story there in more detail. But they go to Cyrus Farnsworth home, and that's where they all, again, Cyrus Farnsworth, Frederick Wheeler, and Joseph Bates, all talk about the Sabbath. And in the front lawn, where there were two major oak trees that are down now, they make a pact to keep the Sabbath. I'll tell you more about that, that story tomorrow. That home still stands. It's right in front of Mill and Pond. And that's where Bates' conviction on the Sabbath was solidified. So, he comes back home to Fairhaven. That's when our story takes place on the bridge. So he's coming by via route of New Bedford. He's coming this direction. And he walks on the bridge. And there he encounters an old friend of his named James Madison Monroe Hall. And Hall, just probably not with a lot of thought put into it, just greeted Bates and said, well, Brother Bates, what's the news? And of course, Bates was all inundated with his thoughts on the Sabbath. And he says, the news, Brother Hall, is that the Sabbath, is that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord our God. And that took place on his bridge. And then he talked to, to Hall about the Sabbath. And Hall became a convert. Joseph Bates was the greatest Sabbath evangelist. And it began right here on this bridge. And he said, what's the news, Captain Bates? Bates replied, the news is that the seventh day is the Sabbath. That's where he on that bridge. So that's why this is obviously a famous place in Adventist history. And a, and a popular stop on the Adventist Heritage Tour. Now there's a number of other stories about Bates. I won't take time to tell those here. Uh, particularly about a financial strait that he was in, some of his publishing feats. Uh, you can read about that in Adventist Pioneer Places. And there are one other story I'm going to read to you from the book, but I'm going to save that until we get to his boyhood home. The only two stops, we'll see a number of places, but we won't get out. We'll only get out here as we have, and then we'll get out at his boyhood home, and I will tell you more about Bates' abolitionist activity there. But I'm not finished yet with Bates in the South. He had lived in the Mulberry home that we will visit here in a few minutes after we're done here over in that direction. He lived in the Mulberry home from about 1832 to 1844, so that's when he was a Millerite during that time. He encountered William Miller's teacher when he was living in the Mulberry home. After the disappointment, he and his wife lived in Prudence, lived in different places. Then in 1845, that's when they moved to the Bunker home back this way, up Main Street. Uh, just down a block from his boyhood home that we'll stop at. We'll only be able to drive by the bunker home because it uh, it's kind of dangerous to get out there. And, and, uh, it would just take a lot of time to walk to it, but we will stop. Maybe if the traffic's not bad, you can take pictures. But the bunker home is where Bates lived from
from 1845 to about 1847. That's where he published his major tracks. And his first major track was published, written at the Bunker Home in, it was published in August of 1846. And the title was this. Compare this with, with uh, Preble's lengthy title. The Sabbath, a perpetual sign. It's a great title, isn't it? It's like a modern day title, The Sabbath, a perpetual sign. And that was what it was about. And the significance of that book is that Bates went beyond Seventh-day Baptist theology on the Sabbath. Seventh-day Baptists only teach the Old Testament teaching regarding the Sabbath and that it's binding for New Testament Christians, and that's about as far as they go. And the Seventh-day Baptists were growing at that point, but since those years they've been declining and they're just a really small group to this day. But what Bates did, he took the Sabbath and he put it in that book, the Sabbath, a perpetual sign. The idea it's a perpetual sign. It continues as a sign for God's people all through generations. It's a sign of God's people at the end of the time. He set the Sabbath in its, to use a big word, in its eschatological context. That is, he put the Sabbath in the context of end-time events. He connected the Sabbath with the mark of the beast. He was the first one to do that. He connected the Sabbath with Revelation 13. He also was the first to articulate from the Bible in Revelation 12, 13, and 14, the great controversy theme. Remember I told you about Ellen White's major great controversy vision, Lovett's Grove, Ohio in 1858. It's listed in the outline I gave you last night. That is without question her most significant vision where she really set forth or the Lord set forth through her the great controversy theme. But as I said also last night, there's no doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church that comes or originated with Ellen White. She may have refined and confirmed it, but it did not originate with her. It originated from the Bible. The great controversy theme was first articulated by Joseph Bates in the Sabbath, the perpetual sign. Through a Bible study, he showed in the context of Revelation how everything converges on God's people at the end of time, and he saw the significance of the three angels' messages in Revelation 14. He connected all of that to the Sabbath. So the Sabbath, the perpetual sign, and in the additions, different editions of it thereafter, it is very significant for the founding of Seventh-day Adventist theology. And that all was right here in Fairhaven, particularly at the Bunker Home. That's why that Bunker Home is really the theological birthplace of Seventh-day Adventism. So, Bates gets the Sabbath. He writes about it in a very theological and articulate way. He is excited about the Sabbath. He shares the Sabbath with everybody. Well, in 1846, James and Ellen, Ellen had been having her vision. She, her first year in 1845 was a number of, of important visions. James had been traveling with her as she shared the visions. They caught each other's attention and fell in love and they got married in early 1846. So by the time they encounter Bates, they are married. Ellen recalls in her autobiography and testimonies, volume one, and several other editions of it, visiting New Bedford, Fairhaven. And she recalls her first encounter with Bates. Now Bates, he was a strong personality. He was a good evangelist, but he was a strong, forceful personality. And I can imagine Bates just almost obsessively talking about the Sabbath and urging people to keep the Sabbath. And he did that with James and Ellen White. And Ellen really wasn't ready for that. I want you to show you something some of you may not know. But this is a quote from Ellen White in her autobiography. I quote, My attention was first called to the Sabbath while I was on a visit to New Bedford, Massachusetts. Elder Bates was keeping the Sabbath and urged its importance. That term urged. He wasn't just, hey, you want to keep the Sabbath. He was urging the Sabbath on her. I did not feel its importance and thought that Elder Bates erred in dwelling upon the fourth commandment more than upon the other nine. So you may or may not know that. If you took out of his heritage, you probably should know that, that Ellen White initially rejected the Sabbath when she heard it from Bates. The Bates continued, and when James and Ellen got a hold of this tract, the Sabbath, a perpetual sign, that convicted them. 
and convince them that they should keep the Sabbath because they saw the larger picture of the Sabbath, its connection with the end of time. And by the way, that's why Seventh-day Adventism to this very day grows by leaps and bounds and the Seventh-day Adventists have remained stagnant in terms of growth because we have given the Sabbath, or I shouldn't say we have, the Bible gives the Sabbath a contemporary urgency. It's not just keep it because there's rest and the Jews kept it and we should keep it, but keep it because yes, all of that too, it's a memorial of creation, it's a memorial of redemption, yes, but it also is very vital and relevant for the last days because it is the, it is the test of loyalty on all mankind. Therefore, it's urgent that we keep the Sabbath today. And that is why our evangelism often works when we share the Sabbath in the context of the mark of the beast and the end of time with people today. So it's very interesting when you see all of that connection. But Ellen and James finally started keeping the Sabbath. And it was like what you find with these pioneers, there was mutual sharing. Bates also had learned about the new understanding of the sanctuary from Crozier and some others who had been doing Bible study on it. James and Ellen had learned about the sanctuary. So here you have Joseph Bates and James and Ellen White uniting on the sanctuary and uniting on the Sabbath. And they'd already been open to this new teaching of the state of the dead. That it's asleep, state of unconsciousness. But one more major hurdle was yet to be leaped over. And that was Bates and Ellen White's visions. He was skeptical of her visions. He didn't believe them initially. But it wasn't until November of 1846. See, 46 was a big year. James Alloway got married, Bates accepted the Sabbath. And then in November of 46, Bates was present when Ellen White had what is called her Open Heavens Vision, where she described some of the heavenly bodies and the planets and the moons around some of the planets. Now, if you know anything about Joseph Bates as a sea captain, they learned to read the stars navigate by the stars. So Bates was, was a lover of the stars in astronomy. And he knew the knowledge, all the knowledge of the day about the planets. It's certainly not, even, not anywhere near the extensive knowledge astronomers have today, but of the astronomers of that day, Bates knew all about it. And Ellen described the moons around some of the planets that she had seen in vision. And Bates listened to that. He convinced him. This is of God. What's his vision called again? The Open Heavens Vision. And at that point, he embraced Ellen White's prophetic ministry and became a supporter of her visions thereafter. So now they were united, not only on the Sabbath the sanctuary, sleep and death, but also on spiritual gifts. And so at that point in 1846, you have the three key leaders of what would eventually become Sabbatarian Adventism and then Seventh-day Adventism. Joseph Bates, James and Ellen White. They are the founders of Seventh-day Adventism. If somebody asks you, who are the key founders of your church? It is Joseph Bates, James and Ellen White. Bates shared with them the Sabbath. They shared with him her spiritual gifts. And they already were united in the sanctuary. And there they had these core doctrinal beliefs in place. And of course, as I shared last night, they would refine them as other believers were uniting in other places in New England on some of the same doctrines. And they would come together at the historic Sabbath conferences in 1848. And so that is the story of Joseph Bates and the Sabbath. And thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that you had a lot of fun learning some more about Seventh-day Adventist history. I sure have enjoyed making the vi these videos. Hope you've enjoyed watching them. Um, be sure to check out more of my cool videos, both Advanced History videos and otherwise, at my YouTube channel. That's www.youtube.com slash tnphotobug. And until next time, this is Geocaster TN Photobug signing out. I am most definitely happy.